the Netherlands is a remote country mostly known for its extreme love for bikers, partygoers, waterworks, the fact that it's my home and lack of anything that you could compare to a mountain even in the slightest. But like most other countries, its roots run deep and the olden ages of it have shown that behind the scenes sayings of dark practices and mysterious encounters would often spread like wildfires. Some dating back so far that not even a specific date can be appointed to it. For this video, I have created a list of 12 folklores and legends, each one originating from a different province in the Netherlands, which we will go by from top to bottom, starting at Groningen and ending at Limburg. I hope you'll enjoy this little unconventional video and without further ado, let's explore 12 rather intriguing and scary myths and legends from the Netherlands. Groningen, het licht van zeerijp. Let's start off with an easy one. Zeerijp is a village almost at the very top end of Groningen. It's said to be incredibly old. Since more than a thousand years ago, it used to be directly connected to the sea with its own harbor. Around this time, the Frisian people that lived there were living under the reign of Radboud II who later and after a heavy war was defeated by a much stronger king named Charles the Great. Someone who was widely known and intended to spread his laws over the entirety of West Europe. The villagers were known to have laws at that time, but they were passed down verbally rather than written, which eventually changed due to Charles' reign. He declared 12 men to spread and write down these laws across the province. However, Due to their allegiance and own vision on Jesus Christ alongside the old Frisian language in which they passed down their laws, they protested for seven days against the king before they were sentenced to death by being sent into the ocean on a boat which had no means of protection nor steering capabilities. It was said that they would slowly but surely be taken by the rough nature of the ocean, which soon also started to set in. Their boat was no match for the sheer chaos during the storms of the ocean. They prayed for help, but to them it seemed like even after their loyalty to Christianity, they were doomed to drown. That is, until they noticed a bright glowing figure only inches behind the boat. It had a growth that it used to seemingly pull the boat along. It also seemed that even though the storm was still raging on, the boat did not seem to feel it and was now constantly moving forward until it managed to reach the harbor of Zeerijp. Of course, this spread beliefs that an angel sent from heaven or even Jesus Christ himself brought the boat to safety. From then on, every night this light was visible when looking towards the harbor. That is, until land started to cover up the village and thus there was no need for a harbor any longer. It's said that during this time, the light would be gone for multiple nights, replaced by another light with a yellow-orange glow. Captains that decided to follow this light, assuming that it would lead them to safety, would meet their demise due to the newly formed land. Because of this, Many believe that the devil would be the one to ignite this light. It's been said that nowadays this light can still be seen moving around the place where once the harbor used to be, still on the search for lost men that tried to sail to safety on stormy nights. Friesland, the Levende Dode. In Dokkum, there once lived a family consisting of a wife, a husband and an elderly mother that moved in with a daughter. The mother was known to be an incredibly friendly woman with a golden heart. Those that were close to passing her house always thought, in a few moments I will meet that nice lady by the window that greets me every day. However, the day soon came that she didn't anymore. She would read the Bible and when she looked up to the people passing by, 
She would look like she had seen true suffering in her eyes. Being afraid to greet them, she would beg, Pass my house by. Please, act like I don't exist. My pain is so deep. Please do not greet me. She would then nod her head as a sign of gratitude to those that passed. By then, her acts made her very well known and loved around the village. She herself knew that her demise was coming and so did her daughter, whom she always told, I lived here my entire life. I wish to die here as well. The villagers also knew that the day would soon come where the lady would not sit in front of the window any longer, and not long after that, this also happened. Her funeral was quick, but she was not forgotten easily. But what makes this tragic tale so scary, you ask? Well, that came the next time people would pass by her window. Each time, loud screaming and crying was heard from the daughter. One day, she would tumble outside crying, Mother! Oh, mother, why did you have to die? Why aren't you here to protect me any longer? This life is too hard for me. He wants to kill me. What most of the villagers didn't know was that these pleads to her mother weren't because of her grief, but because of the endless pain that he inflicted upon her, the insults, the hitting and the mistreatment every night he came home drunk. It almost became too much for her, until one day a young man screamed outside the house, causing her to rush towards him before he pointed to the window, causing her heart to skip a beat. A dull and transparent figure looked outside the window, a sweet smile across its face. The husband also saw the manifestation and angrily blamed the daughter for it, telling her that he will not put up with that woman in their house any longer. Desperately, he tried to change the glass of the window, tried to move around the house, swearing to entirely live inside the attic in order to just be away from the mother. Daily, the husband would check if she was still sitting there and the daughter would occasionally ask the mother for answers to which she never responded. Years would pass by, becoming a true memorial to every husband that even dared of thinking to hurt their wives. Each day she would greet the people passing by her window. Each day she would protect her daughter from her awful husband, while the husband was slowly driven to insanity. Until the day the spirit of the mother suddenly vanished from this day forward, people never heard from the daughter or the husband ever again, leading many to believe that they passed away. Noord-Holland had spoke van Zeedijk. It's the 18th century, and we're traversing Zeedijk in Amsterdam. A man by the name of Gerard was a father of two beautiful daughters named Dina and Helena. One kind and soft of heart, the other temperamental and arrogant. One day, a young sailor by the name of Wouter visited the tannery which the father owned and fell heads over heels in love with the kind-hearted Dina, who due to the man's devotion and affection towards her couldn't help but also fall in love with him. However, these feelings were also shared by her sister Helena who tried everything in order to get the sailor's attention. She was very cunning and had an incredible charm which she used to persuade him, but to no avail. The time came when the sailor had to part ways with Dina and promised to keep in touch with her through letters, which however never reached her. Dina knew that Helena was the one to blame and confronted her about it. Blinded by love and jealousy, Helena attacked her and threw her down a hatch that led to the basement of the tannery. This caused Dina to fall unconscious for a long while and Helena locked the basement without a second thought. During this time, Helena told others that questioned her about Dina's whereabouts that she was merely staying over at a friend's house. That night, she revisited the basement equipped with a long wooden rod and beat a slowly awakening Dina's head multiple times in order to ensure she was 
more than just unconscious this time. Clinging to her last bit of life, Dina promised the sister that from that day onward, it would be the last peaceful sleep she would ever know. Dina's body was found days later, and it was deemed an accident. The sailor, wrecked with grief, was eventually persuaded by the charms of the sister, and it looked like her gamble had truly paid off. That was until her memories turned on her. Day and night, she would be reminded of her awful deed. She led a life full of peace on the outside, but misery on the inside. Eventually, on her deathbed, she confessed to the man of her dreams of her awful crime, who in disgust left her to die alone on the 24th of July, 1753. That same night, Zedaik was awakened by an awful orchestra of crying and shouting, originating from the tannery of the father. Exactly a century later, the same crying was heard. The myth became so popular that on the same day, 1953, people gathered around the place where once the tannery stood, hoping to hear the same event play out, only for said event not to occur. Following this, there was a certain set of people that claimed to either hear or see the spirit around the area on occasion. But who knows? For those that are planning to go on vacation in Amsterdam, take a stroll around Zedek at night. If you feel a cold shudder all over your body, take your time and look around. There is a chance that Helena is nearby. Flevoland the Motketel van Schokland. This tale has a rather strange name, as it revolves less around a cauldron and more around different events in the village. Schokland used to be a small island in the middle of Lake Isel before it became dry land. Back in those days, many captains that sailed past the island reported a strange fire and groups of what they believed to be witches and wizards dancing around what seemed to be a cauldron. Others mentioned that they haven't seen fires, but rather said to have seen witches and wizards flying to the location on broomsticks. Villagers around that time were frightened by the tales, and mapped out the time and place where said rituals were held on those nights. They closed and locked all windows and doors and went to bed early. This, however, didn't always mean that they were safe as some reported to all see strange figures sometimes resting at their hearths, before suddenly disappearing. There were certain special nights as well in which the full moon would reveal a ghost ship above the land. This would cause the witches and wizards to dance even more chaotic around the fire, singing very disturbing songs. This was an indication that a ship was lost at sea. One particular story tells the tale of a man who attended one of these rituals in secret and threw his knife at one of the cats that accompanied the witches. Years later, he would leave Schokland in order to move to another town named Hardewijk. One night, he went out to get something to eat, only to be given said knife by a hostess at the inn to which he asked, Where did you get this knife? The lady responded with a dark grin, as she lifted her skirt to reveal her scar. You gave it to me, remember? You're lucky we didn't catch you that night. Heed my warning. Never throw this at another cat. Next time, you won't be as lucky. Drenthe, the Duvelskule. Once upon a time in Kukange, there lived a farmer with his family in rough times. Their animals were starving and gave little to no product for them to live off of. The land gave equally as little. They barely managed to survive on the food they did manage to harvest. The family was broken. The wife constantly made remarks on how idiotic she was to ever marry a worthless man like himself. This caused him to mentally break, and one day take a noose to a tree with the intention to hang himself. That's when he was greeted by a limping beggar. He looked up at him and wondered what he was doing. 
When the man confessed to him that he wasn't able to live like this any longer, the beggar replied, Don't do this. Now, concerning your wife, I think I'm only of little help. But I do wish to help you around the farm. I have nothing better to do anyways. The farmer was skeptical and told the shabby cloaked man that he won't be able to pay him with anything other than maybe cow or goat milk, to which the beggar replied, That I don't mind. All I ask from you in return is when you do not have any work left from me, I ask you to do what I say. The farmer laughed at this, and they both agreed to it. It started with replacing the roof on the farm, since a cold fall weather was approaching and he was worried that it would destroy the roof in its entirety if nothing was done about it. To his surprise, the beggar had the entire job done within the next three days. The beggar seemed a very eager man and did job after job for the farmer, having jobs that would take in weeks done in mere days. This caused the farmer to become suspicious of the beggar and after closely examining him, he would eventually notice that his legs and feet were not those of a human, but those of a goat. It was clear that this beggar was the devil himself and that it wouldn't be long until he would show his true face. Trying to force the devil out of his disguise, the man gave him an impossible task. The rope of the bucket over the well outside is broken. I want you to create a new one created from sand, which is sturdy enough so even my grandchildren will be able to use it. The devil then responded, You miserable donkey! Someone else, much smarter than you, thought of that one before. Having been revealed, the devil stomped on the ground, making it burst and crack until a large pit opened up under the well before the devil disappeared. The farmer and wife tried to close up the pit again with everything they had, but to no avail. They believed that it was a punishment for trying to outsmart the devil. Normally, these pits would be covered up by iron grating in order to prevent animals from falling into it. The devil's pit, however, was never covered up. It was the belief of the villagers that not covering up the pit would prevent the devil from reappearing. Overijssel, de verschijningen van de Goethe. The Goethe is one of many rivers that originate from Lake Ijssel. Weird occurrences seem to happen in this river at night, when one decides to go fishing there. One occurrence tells the tale of two fishermen that went out to fish in the Goethe for a couple of days. At night, the assistant of the fisherman was woken up by a strange noise that sounded like singing. He woke up the fisherman and asked him if he could hear it too. Indeed he did. In the distance he could hear a dreamy voice sing, The lamp brandt. De lamp brandt, maar wij gaan liever over zand. They decided to investigate, and since they had a quite decently sized ship, they heard that it came from outside their cabin. As they exited the cabin, they found four silhouettes of men outside on the deck, slowly approaching the port side as they kept on singing. When they did, they pressed their eight hands down onto the framing, and with immense power far beyond that of the ordinary human, they managed to slowly capsize the entire ship. Shocked by the display in front of them, the fishermen figured out a reason why these humanoid creatures were doing this. It could be their punishment for their net fishing practices. Regaining his strength, he tried to get the ship back in control before escaping the Goethe and promising himself to never fish here ever again. Eventually, another fisherman tried to exercise the same practices that had gotten the previous ones in trouble. This fisherman came across a small farmhouse next to the river. He too was warned by the experiences others had made in this river but decided not to believe them. When coming across this house, he and his assistant saw a figure standing there engulfed in flames and pointing at them, causing them to barely escape with their lives due to mishaps slowly breaking down the ability to properly steer the ship. 
The last tale was about a fisherman who saw a small white cloud hovering about the same area where the fiery man once stood. When lingering on the water for too long, this cloud slowly became bigger and bigger, trying to engulf them in it. They had to sail for quite a while in order for the cloud to finally leave them be. One of the fishermen claimed to have seen a white creature manifesting inside the cloud. One thing is clear from all of this. If you wish to go fishing someday, you definitely shouldn't do it in the Goethe. But if you're stubborn and still wish to do so, be prepared to also face the consequences for your actions. Gelderland, de weerwolf van het bos van Engbergen. Gelderland is very known to have many forests that contain tales of werewolves. The most known tale out of all of these is the tale of the werewolf of Engbergen, a forest between the cities Gendringen and Voorst. I presume that this tale has gained popularity simply because of how recent it is, as this folklore came around to be around the year 2003, but of that I'm unsure. The tale tells the story of a couple on their way home from a party. The boy, Dan, is drunk and decides to take a leak next to a tree while his lover, Marie, tells him that she'll be walking ahead. Since the moon lights up the path pretty well, he should still be able to see her when he's done. She was quite hasty since she knew the forest was dangerous around that time. Not because of the rumors of werewolves, but mainly due to the more natural factors of animals and possible crimes. Next to that, it was pretty cold, which caused her to put on a red poncho to have a somewhat extra warmth. After approximately 30 feet of walking, a loud rustling of leaves made her turn around, and what she saw made her question her sanity. She saw a dark being staring at her from deep within the woods, something that represented a wolf but was much larger than what was considered ordinary for such a beast. Being paralyzed and acting purely out of instinct, she ran away, leaving Dan behind, as the only thing she focused on at the moment was surviving. She could hear the cracking of branches and loud stomps on the ground as the wolf chased her down, even feeling a harsh tug and rip from her poncho as the wolf seemingly bit part of it off. Eventually, though, she managed to reach her farmhouse and waited there shaking in horror as Dan rushed up to her asking her what happened in a worried tone. When she told her lover what happened, he at first thought it was a normal wolf attack. When Marie, however, detailed the story a little more, Dan, not believing the story very much, laughed hard and with a wide open mouth, through which Marie was able to notice the small pieces of red fabric between his teeth. Utrecht, het IJzeren Veulen. In Kabau, a small village in Lopnik, Utrecht, probably one of the most intriguing Dutch folklore so far resides. Probably because many people that one would address around these regions know of this myth. The tale dates back quite some time, so far that people cannot properly address it. It tells the tale of a small creature that trotted out of a country road. This creature resembled a foal but emitted horrible screeches. The creature itself looked like it was made of iron and its limbs were made of hinges bending forth and back. Kabau was known to have a few bridges between which the foal would constantly trot around during midnight and 1am. It's been said that many people have tried to stop the foal but weren't able to. Not even three muscular men equipped with clubs were able to even put a dent into it. The foal then charged one of these men with such vigor and speed that when it actually collided with the man, it immediately broke all of his ribs, causing heavy internal bleedings, after which the man died. It took a priest who blessed the bridges and roads for multiple hours before the creature would finally disappear. There have also been abbreviations of this story that said that when the Iron Foal was driven off, it called back to the priest that it would return in 100 years. The most intriguing part of this story is that this was not the only sighting of the creature. There have been numerous sightings around the Netherlands, such as around the area of Hoevelaken, and also between the cities Kesteren and Leiden, 
people have reported seeing the iron foal. To this day, it is unsure what exactly the iron foal is and what its ultimate goal is. What is known about it, however, is that when you see it, it's best not to get too close, as its attack most of the times kills instantaneously. Zuid-Holland, the legende van het Soulse Gat. On the Veluwe, a forest between Putten and Garderen and Drie, lies the Soul's Hall. A large pit between two hills. Once this used to be the place of a large and powerful monastery with a bunch of watchtowers and the candles that surrounded the estate. However, the beauty of this once magnificent building fades when one learns about the dark practices executed inside. It's been said that the monks that have watched over the place all sold their souls to the devil. This caused them to lead a life full of extravagance and opulence. During the nights they dabbled in the satanic rituals and sayings to worship the devil alongside ghosts and witches that attended the rituals. Wine was drank in masses. The people were fed with more food than was necessary, all for sheer pleasure. Curses were made and satanic songs were sang. Many people from the nearby village were frightened of the creepy sounds that they heard during the night. Whenever they looked at the estate they saw that the windows were shut and the inside always was brightly lit. One particular night, however, there was a storm brewing outside, so heavy that people remained indoors for their own safety. The entire town was shook when they suddenly heard a loud thunderclap hit nearby. The next morning, a boy came running into the village shouting that the entire monastery had disappeared and a very large pit was all that remained. The trees surrounding the pit were burned or torn out of the earth. Ever since then, people have rumored to hear strange sounds coming from beneath the earth of the pit around midnight. A quiet yet hoarse thumping of bells seems to be heard, which gets increasingly louder, as if the bells were damaged. There have also been reports that the ghosts of the monks roam around outside, moaning and sobbing they circle around the pit, causing a blue essence to rise up from the hole. They then spread out into the forest only to slowly approach it again. This seemingly goes on until daylight, after which they flee the scenery, wailing as they return back into the depths of the pit. It is unsure what this display means, and if the tale has any truth to it. However, some people believe that old Germanic rituals were held around this place in which people have worshipped the sun. Because of the fact that later on people with Christian beliefs preferred to create buildings on places where religious ceremonies were held, it is not very unlikely that a monastery might have actually existed here. Zeeland De ondergang van Westerschouwen Westerschouwen used to be a place where people lived in great fortune. Year after year the city grew and every year the sailors that went out onto the sea came back with big catches. These years of immense wealth led to the people of Westerschouwen becoming selfish, arrogant and filled with pride. Everywhere they went they would tell tales of how there existed no better city than Westerschouwen. Nowhere people had faster ships with a crew consisting of only the best of sailors. This pride led to them also cutting themselves off from the rest of the country. Where there was poverty was none of their business. Where there was sorrow they needn't help. You are on your own, they said. We had to survive ourselves, and thus so should you. While their backs filled themselves with riches, their hearts became colder and colder. One day, however, one of the many ships out on the sea made a surprising catch. Within the large net, filled with fish, the men spotted a white lady with beautiful grass-green hair and a sparkling scale tail, a mermaid. Being shocked at first at the sight of such a magnificent creature, the men shouted with joy as they noticed that the lady was unharmed. Loudly bragging to all of the other ships of their catch, filled with greed, the men however were not prepared to let her go. 
A scared and teary expression filled the mermaid's face, causing the men to laugh in great joy, making fun of the creature and shaming her for her looks, asking her who in the world would be willing to ever love an abomination like herself. She was hoisted onto a mast and stretched out her arms calling towards the sea when the men saw another creature approaching in a rapid motion. It was the merman this time, who pleaded to the man to let his wife go, to which the man only responded with a loud laughter yet again. Wanting is one thing, getting it is another! <laughs> one of the men shouted towards him. When they reached the shore, the mermaid was close to her demise, having been parted from the water for a long while. Nobody showed any remorse for their actions, and another act of pleading only resulted in the people throwing rocks at the merman. Blinded with rage and lust for vengeance, the merman showed his true face, lifting from the waters and chanting loudly, Vestus Gauwen, Vestus Gauwen, Het zal je berouwen dat je hebt genomen mijn vrouw. Vester schouwen, daarom zul je vergaan. Alleen je toren zal blijven staan. Maar als je geeft me vrouw weerom, dan bouwen we om het stadje ballen rondom. A last yet firm warning and bargain towards the people of the city before he disappeared in the depths of the sea. Yet again, however, he was met with laughter and mockery. Days later, tragedy struck the once so beautiful city. Harbors bogged down, unusable by the amounts of sand that clogged up the piers. Merchants and trade ships stopped entering the city and thus the wealthy community slowly degraded into poverty. The sand, however, kept on coming, now even covering the city itself in absurd amounts, causing the roofs of houses to cave in and people to slowly part ways from the city. Soon, all that was left was a watchtower. For ages, this tower remained there, unfaced by even the most dreadful of weathers. A last memorial to the lost city, and a reminder to those that thinks selfishness is the path to a fulfilling life. Noord Brabant, de stille ronde van Bergen op Zoom. In Bergen op Zoom, there is an old saying that reminds people of one of the most cruel local majors, nicknamed the Devil. A graf haar bij de as verweet, maar als oude geest vindt rust nog vrede. In de duistere nacht van het lijk gesteend. En vaak ontsluit hij aan die steden. Te middernacht als storm en tiert. En regent als men de uilen hun grafgezang wordt huilen. De weerhaan knersend giert. A very strict and horrible military major was known to frequently patrol the city of Bergen op Zoom. He was known to strike fear in those he passed by, merely by his appearance and behavior. I'd rather die than be under the devil's command, is what the villagers would say if he passed by. In his one hand he held a whip that perfectly matched his gloves, and he loved to kick the spurs of his heels into his horse so hard that it would forcefully prance from the pain. When the people would shove aside in fear, he'd laugh loudly and shout, I wish I could clobber them all! or watch them fall under the hooves of my horse and crawl away in agony. He also was known to have a son named Alphonse, who in contrast to the Major was loved all across the lands. He was known to be a giddy, quick-witted and overall happy young man. It was truly a mystery how someone like him could be the son of a devil like the Major. One particular day, the soldiers under his command Men who also referred to their own major as the devil came together when they heard loud drumming outside in the distance. They saw the devil approaching with a couple of men that held something covered in black cloaking in their hands. From a distance approaching, the devil shouted, This ought to stop! If I ever find another sentinel sleeping on the post, 
I'll be the one to put a bullet between his eyes. How can I put trust in my men when they fall asleep on the job? Proudly smirking at his men, he continued. Let this be a reminder. I caught one tonight, sleeping like a horse. Now, he'll be able to reflect on his actions in either heaven or hell. Surprised and in shock, the man and his son remained silent, much to the pleasure of the Major. I'm glad you all think the same. Understand, however, that I expect the same from you. No mercy for the sentinel that does not stand guard. I thank you. Days passed, and for the son it became more and more difficult, as he was deeply ashamed of his father's behavior. A plan was made between him and the other men to secretly waken every sentinel that had fallen asleep. This plan worked until the day the devil rounded up his men once again and ordered them to directly shoot every sentinel that had fallen asleep. As if they were spotted not doing so, they would be killed themselves as well. It was one particular night, when the devil did his patrol, that he found yet another sentinel asleep. Without hesitation, he drew his pistol and shot him. Only to soon later find out that it was his own son. Without a speck of remorse, the Major said, I shall kill anyone who doesn't fulfill his duty, even if that is to be my own son. Appearing strong and ruthless on the outside to many, was but a broken man on the inside. A bleak expression continuously stretched across the devil's face, as one day he visited the place where he shot Alphonse. Tired, but still with pep in his step, and consumed by the former memories of better days with his son, he stood in front of it, calmly drew his gun, and shot himself. To this day, in stormy nights, one can be able to hear the laughing voices presumably of soldiers waking the sleeping sentinels. The rhythmic sound of marching and jangling of iron spurs, and very rarely a gunshot of the man who stopped at nothing to fulfill his duty. Limburg, the dolende pilgrider. Ending our list of myths and legends is the story of a knight from the Pale, a large piece of land marking the border between Limburg and North Brabant. Back in the early days it was a swampland known for its many unusual and frightening occurrences. Many tales were told surrounding the area, ranging from old and haunted farms to voices coming from the many lakes. Some even called it the home of the devil due to its many supernatural events. Because of this, many people avoided the area in general. One particular passage was the winding road from Mayol to Savenham. Many people believed to have heard cries for help from a knight that became lost trying to roam the Pale on his own. People who followed his cries soon had set the first steps in a swamp nicknamed Dolle Moor, a bog where one could easily sink away in, where the ground would latch onto one's knees and pull one down fast, suffocating them under the earth. The knight was known to be a rogue plunderer, who with his men frequently attacked farms and villages. Until one day the people were prepared for his arrival and managed to ambush him. Being easily overpowered, only the knight equipped with his golden saber and his squire managed to escape on their horses. On their way back, however, they also got lost in the moor. Never to make it out again, they also sank away in the bog. People claimed that only if the greedy knight were to ever be found would the passage to Savenham be safe once more. Surprisingly, the last province on this list also proves to be the best legend on this list in my opinion. Why? Well, because there actually might be some truth to it. One day, a peat digger seemingly has managed to dig up remnants of the knight around the area such as his helmet, leather and coins. To this day, the presumed lost knight can be viewed in a museum in Leiden. The only thing missing was his golden saber. So maybe, just maybe, when you travel around the winding road in Pale, 
you too can still hear the cries for help coming from the Lost Knight. And that was this list of 12 intriguing and scary myths and legends from my home country, the Netherlands. I hope you all enjoyed, and we'll see each other in my next creation.